Brunton Pocket Transit, in one form or another, has been in production since 1894 and was the standard instrument used from the dawn of cave survey for collecting azimuth and inclination data. It's still manufactured today, though since the early 1980s it's very rarely used by cavers. Its primary use is for geological field mapping to measure the strike and dip of things such as sedimentary strata and faults. However, it still has the accuracy, precision, small size, and durability to be used for generating quality cave survey measurements. It has fallen out of favor because the instrument is somewhat expensive and far more difficult to read than alternatives such as the Sun 2 or Brunton sighting instruments or the Disto X2. The Pocket Transit has a base side and a mirror side with a hinge in the middle. It comes with a leather carry pouch and it's recommended to have the mirror face away from the closure snap to better protect it. There are several versions of the transit with measurement units in azimuth degrees, quadrant degrees, or mils. The azimuth degree version is the favorite choice for cave survey. The standard instrument has an aluminum housing, but there's a less expensive and lighter version made from composite plastic as well. The compass uses a magnetic needle that is balanced on a sapphire bearing, and the current versions use magnetic induction to dampen the oscillations of the needle to more quickly get a stable reading. The capsule containing the needle is waterproof, but air-filled rather than liquid-filled. When looking at the face of the compass, you'll notice that the east and west bearings are reversed. This is because the transit is a direct reading compass. In other words, the needle points to a value on the compass dial that is a measurement of the orientation of the compass's base. The result is a numbering orientation that is reversed from what you see on a conventional base plate compass with a rotating dial. The north end of the needle is painted white, and the south-facing end is black and there's a round bubble level that is used to level the base for azimuth readings. The graduated circle of the compass has one degree small tick marks and larger tick marks every five degrees with labels every 10 degrees. Brunton claims that you can read between the tick marks to the nearest 0.5 degrees, but this requires very sharp vision and the stabilization that can probably only be achieved with a tripod. The graduated ring can be adjusted for declination using a brass screw on the outside corner of the instrument but it is strongly recommended that this just be set to zero for cave survey so that all measurements are relative to magnetic north. Declination can be adjusted during data entry using either calibration course data or standard declination charts. Trying to adjust for the proper local declination before each day of cave survey is very likely to introduce systematic errors into the data. The mirror has a center line and a sighting hole near its base and a small sight at the top. Opposite the mirror is the large sight with a peep sight at its top. The angle of the mirror and the large sight can be adjusted for a variety of different azimuth and inclination reading configurations. In the base of the compass's capsule is a long level attached to a vernier that can be adjusted with a lever on the bottom of the instrument for taking inclination measurements. And there are both degree and percent gradient scales for these vertical angles. There is a needle lock button that is activated when the lid is closed to keep the delicate needle from moving around during transport. There are several different configurations of the mirror and sights that can be used to take a compass azimuth reading. Most of these begin with placing the instrument base directly above or below the survey station you're shooting from. There are various sighting lines, holes, and notches in both the mirror side and the large sight side of the pocket transit. Taking a reading involves lining up sights on each side of the instrument with each other and the survey station you're shooting to, and then making sure the base is level before taking a reading. For azimuth readings, there are three main techniques known as the mirror method, shadow method, and gun sight method. The mirror method is the most often used and is probably the best when you're in larger cave passage. You position the pocket transit directly above or below the station you're shooting from, and you get your eye directly above the face for taking measurements. The mirror is open to about 135 degrees and the large sight is open most of the way and pointed towards the target station. You position yourself directly above the face and tilt the mirror and rotate the base until the target can be seen in the mirror. The sighting line on the mirror is aligned with the pointer at the top of the large sight and the target station. Then look at the round level and adjust the base until it's level. With a level base and targets aligned with the station, the white or north needle position is read from the graduated circle. As with Suntu sighting instruments, you should do this alignment with one eye closed to avoid various types of reading errors. For steeper angle shots, the angle of both the mirror and large sight can be adjusted while keeping the base level. It's generally possible to take readings when the station you're shooting to is between 15 degrees below and 45 degrees above the current station. 
For better precision, it helps to stabilize the transit against a rock or wall rather than just hand holding it. With any of the reading methods, both hands should be used on the instrument for maximum stability. The shadow method is somewhat unique to cave survey. You won't find this described in the Brutton Pocket Transit Manual because it requires darkness. The mirror and large sight are open much like in the mirror method, with the large sight facing the target, but with the large sight angled closer to 45 degrees. The point person holds a flashlight or headlamp on the target station and points it back towards the instrument, which is centered directly above or below the from station. The mirror needs to be made partially opaque in order to be able to see the shadow of the large sight on its surface. The easiest way is to carry with you a piece of frosted mylar that can be placed over the mirror. But some cavers just breathe on the mirror, and in the high humidity of the cave, this fogs the mirror's surface. Now the instrument person rotates and tilts the transit until the shadow of the large sight is perfectly aligned with the sighting line on the mirror, and the base is level. As with the mirror method, you should be directly above the face of the instrument, and can then read the north needle position against the graduated circle. The shadow method is the favorite technique of some cavers, and is often a better choice in tighter or more awkward passages. Like the mirror method, it's useful for reading shots in the vertical angle range from minus 15 to plus 45. The gun sight method can be slightly less accurate, but it doesn't require being directly above or below the station. The large sight is opened all the way to a horizontal position and the peep sight tilted up, and the mirror is only open to 45 degrees. With the back of the mirror facing the target, Look through the peep sight and locate the target station through the small sighting hole at the base of the mirror. With one eye closed, align the peep sight with the mirror center line and the target station. Then look into the mirror and locate the round level and adjust the base of the transit until it's level. Once the instrument is level and everything is lined up, very gently press the needle lock button with the left index finger. Bring the face of the instrument around and read the position of the south or black end of the compass needle. You read from the opposite end of the needle because you're orienting the instrument backwards from how it would be normally aligned. One of the advantages of this method is that you can read it from positions behind or in front of the station as long as the instrument and the two survey stations are aligned, just as you can with a Suntu sighting compass. It's less accurate though because it's very difficult to see the round level in the mirror and adjust it properly, and it's also very difficult to press the needle lock button without causing it to deflect a couple of degrees. You'll need to use your ungloved hand, and you should first practice your needle lock pressing technique to see how best to press it without causing a change in the reading. It can be a challenge. The large sight can be angled up while still sighting through the hole in the base of the mirror for progressively steeper negative inclinations. For very steep downward shots beyond 45 degrees, you can open the large sight all the way and sight the target station directly through the small hole in the base of the mirror while looking into the mirror to align its center line with the large sight. For positive angled shots, you can align with the peep sight on the top of the mirror. For very steep positive angle shots above 30 degrees, you can tilt the large sight up to vertical or even slightly overhanging the face and open the mirror almost all the way until you can align the top of the large sight with the target station reflected in the mirror and aligned with the mirror center line. You will be positioned behind the large sight but should be able to see the round level for leveling the base. These variations of the gun sight method are the best way to read very steep angle shots. But with all of these techniques, you need to remember to always read the black or south end of the compass needle. Taking a vertical angle or inclination reading is almost identical to the standard gun sight method. Open the large sight all the way, tilt the peep sight up, and tilt the mirror up 45 degrees. Position the instrument onto its left side with the face of the compass pointing to your left. With the base of the transit next to the station at the same elevation, sight through the peep sight and the small hole in the base of the mirror until the sights are aligned with the target station. While looking in the mirror, rotate the vernier and long level using the small lever on the bottom of the transit with your right hand until the bubble in the long level is centered. With the sights and station aligned and the bubble centered, you can bring the instrument up and take a vertical angle reading. You want to take a reading using the center line of the vernier against the outer scale of numbers, which is the degree scale. As with the graduated circle, the vertical angle scale has tick marks for each degree. Using the 30 and 60 minute auxiliary marks on the vernier, 
and finding the one that most closely lines up with the degree mark. It's possible to take a reading to the nearest 30 minutes, or 0.5 degrees. There isn't much point in trying to be more precise than this. Some of the difficulty in taking readings with the Brunton Pocket Transit is due to the need to simultaneously align multiple sites with the target while also paying attention to getting the instrument level and then taking a reading. For some of the reading configurations, you're trying to look at three different things simultaneously, which is why keeping the instrument stable is so important. For this reason, many cavers use a small, non-magnetic tripod, or they mount the pocket transit to a plexiglass or aluminum base plate so they can keep the instrument from moving while they switch their focus from alignment to leveling to reading. The pocket transit is unlikely to make a comeback in cave surveys, but those who are simply interested in other ways to collect accurate survey data might benefit from picking up a used Brunton and experimenting with it. It's a versatile device and an interesting piece of cave exploration history. I want to end by acknowledging West Virginia caver George Dasher and his book On Station. Much of the information for this tutorial was gathered from this excellent resource.